and it becomes more difficult when we start to look at these artificial systems. How do we define when one of these has become intelligent? As I said last week, a lot of the general definitions about artificial intelligence revolve around this idea if a machine can do something that a human can do, we class it as intelligent. So we've got this quote here from a paper by Legan Hunter. I'll talk more about this paper. The paper's called Universal Intelligence, the Definition of Machine Intelligence, which is published in a journal called Minds and Machines. And the paper, this is the very first paragraph of the paper. What is intelligence? It's a concept we use in our everyday lives that seems to have a fairly concrete, though perhaps naive, meaning. We say that our friend who got an A in his calculus test is very intelligent. Or perhaps the cat who has learned to go into hiding when you mention the word vet. So this intuitive notion of intelligence presents us with no difficulties. We can all see that. But if we attempt to dig deeper and define it in precise terms, we find the concept to be very difficult to nail down. Perhaps it's the ability to learn quickly that's central to intelligence. Or perhaps the sum of your knowledge is more important. Perhaps communication and the ability to use language play a central role. What about thinking? Or the ability to perform abstract reasoning? How about creativity? Solving problems? Intelligence involves a perplexing mixture of concepts, many of which are difficult to define. So you can see that there's all these different ways we can view intelligence. Is it about knowledge? Is it about creativity? It's about communication. And no one's ever come up with a standard one phrase or measure of something we can do. Sure, we have some IQ tests, but people argue the psychologists have IQ tests, but um, a lot of argument about those and what they actually measure, and they're only measuring a portion of what we class as intelligence. So we're now coming round to this idea of machines having intelligence. Without reading the sheet, does anyone want to have a guess of what we would say about artificial intelligence? Uh, Mark Minsky said that it was uh, getting machines to do things that would be considered intelligent if a human did them. That's Marvin Minsky. And as I've said, those are the standard definitions people use. If a human can do it, um, um, if, if a human would class it as intelligent and a machine can do it, we class that machine as intelligent, which is a fairly, it seems a common sense definition of artificial intelligence. Yeah? I guess it's more like a question, but is there, is intelligence and consciousness kind of in two different categories? Like in the video, the guy was saying, does the machine know it? It does the machine know. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about exactly that. We're defining artificial intelligence, and the next thing we're going to define is artificial consciousness. <laughs> okay? They are separate, they are separate things too. And this is the problem. Whenever we talk about, whenever you have this question about artificial intelligence, and you talk to people, and if, if you tell people you're studying artificial intelligence, they always ask you, will machines take over the world? Will machines have theories? And you always have to say that's not artificial intelligence, that's artificial consciousness. We're talking about two different things. So, um, the, um, the, uh, well, the Minsky definition is a kind of standard one that people have tended, tended to agree with. So, Artificial intelligence is the intelligence of machines and robots and a branch of computer science that aims to create it. So, it's a bit like, um, what is human-computer interaction? It's the study of humans interacting with computers. What is artificial intelligence? It's the intelligence of machines. It's not a very good definition. The standard definition is the study and design of intelligent agents. Agents being this generic term for some device or process. 
where an intelligent agent is a system that perceives its environment and takes actions that maximize its chances of success. So we have these, um, John McCarthy who, who coined the term artificial intelligence in 1955 at the Dartmouth con conference defines it as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. Um, but this definition of intelligence, what humans can do, we have the chess computers that, that can beat us at chess. We have the kind of calculating machines. They can perform calculations far faster than any human will ever do. But a computer can't cross the road. You know, something we do every day and take for granted. The actual act of looking at cars, judging speeds, making those decisions, computers find that kind of task really difficult. Summarizing a short story, very difficult thing for a computer to do, but with the calculations. So there are different tasks that computers can do better than us and tasks they find very difficult. Um, facial recognition, another one, something we do very well, computers find very different, difficult. So the central problems of artificial intelligence include traits of reasoning, knowledge, planning, learning, communication, perception, and the ability to move and manipulate objects. So these are things we see as distinctly human, where things we do. We, we are able to look and recognize what's in our environment, to understand that. We're able to reason, to make deductive judgments from information we have. If you look outside and it's raining, you know to take an umbrella. How do you know that? Um, how do you learn things? How do you gain new knowledge and build this up? Can the machines learn rather than just having explicit rules? Can they learn more information? So these are the central things we're looking at which are quite distinctly and artificial intelligence is a very fractured discipline. Lots of people work in different areas of AI. There are people working in vision processing, people working in uh, knowledge bases, people working in machine learning. And these disciplines don't talk to each other. They're all, it's a very fragmented subject area. So the whole field of artificial intelligence was founded on the idea that this central property of humans, this thing we call intelligence, can be so precisely described that it can be simulated. And what we've come to learn is that there isn't one thing called intelligence. We have all these things that we do. And we need to describe these individually to teach machines how to do. And this raises philosophical um, which we started to look at from the very first. Uh, any book on artificial intelligence will bring these things up very quickly. The mind, the ethic, um, the nature of the mind and the ethics of creating these artificial beings or intelligent sentient beings. And these have been addressed by lots of science fiction, by myth and by philosophy since ancient times we've contemplated these questions. So, as I said last week, artificial intelligence has what they call wind period winters, where funding stops and there's very little research, then, you, then they have a sudden boost again and lots of people working in AI, then it goes down. And this has gone up and down over the past uh, 40 or 50 years. Sometimes they're very optimistic, as I showed you, people predicting we'll have intelligent machines in a few years and then they suffer setbacks and go backwards and then it starts again. But it's an essential part of t technology now, providing practical solutions. Yeah? Are we in winter or summer right now? I'd say we're in the summer. There's a lot of work going on in AI at the moment. Um, the 90s, the 90s um, were, I did my PhD in the late 80s, early 90s and AI there was a big AI boom through the 80s which went off in the 90s there were practically no AI work and then at the turn of the century it started to come back again 
and it's come, been getting stronger and more work. And, and a lot of that is technology driven, when a new technology comes out, or um, much of this is on the speed of processes now. There's been such great advances that they can do so much more that people have got interested in it. Yeah? I was just going to add that uh, I think it was as a the Google Car. And, and it, there's, there's been a lot of articles. Yeah, there's been a lot of articles on it. Like, well, you have to sign a liability thing on it. Um, so, like, if it gets in an accident, it's your fault. The driverless yeah, car. Yeah, the driverless car. I mean, it's, it's real close to it. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of. It, it's, it's, it's a practical application. I was just going to talk about some of the practical applications. So, you don't want to think about artificial consciousness like, for example, do we have a robot that behaves as if it's human? Do we have these things? But look at the practical things artificial intelligence has done. So, um, if you buy a washing machine now, it will have a fuzzy logic control. An artificial intelligence controller to make it more energy efficient. It will know when to increase the power room how to control the spin cycle. Um, it will have knowledge about that built into it. Um, the use of uh, AI in um, quality control. There's a, a nice example. Some of the people who manufacture pizzas, you don't want to get pizza which have, if you order a pepperoni, buy a pepperoni, a frozen pepperoni pizza, you don't want to get pizza with no pepperoni on it. But it's kind of random how much pepperoni goes on these things. So they have a camera above a conveyor belt which looks and can recognize when there's enough pieces of pepperoni on the pizza. It's a little artificial intelligence system that's been trained to learn how much pepperoni should be on a pizza. So little practical things. They're not, they're not conscious machines, but they are using artificial intelligence techniques to do practical, useful things. And we'll maybe look at some of those. Any comments on that? Questions? Yes? All these what, sorry? Terminology. Um, mm -hmm. Fuzzy logic uh, has been brought up many, many times. I'm sorry, we can just like We will look at fuzzy logic when we do rubers next week. Okay. But um, fuzzy logic was mentioned in the class. It's basically, um, <coughs> there was a question that was asked about machines only working on Boolean operations, something's true or false. And fuzzy logic um, is a way where we can have shades of grey and we can have opinions in a computer system. So that's where you're talking about the infinite between zero and one? The infinite between zero and one, yes. So uh, the problem we have is we can build a computer system that says if it is raining then use an umbrella, you know, a simple rule. But there are, but the question where you say if it is cold, get your cold, what you think is cold is different to what I think. And so that becomes, there's no, you don't say, a computer can have this rule that if it's less than 50 degrees, then we have a cup. But what we can do with fuzzy logic is we can start to have these variations where your version of cold is within these kind of boundaries and areas, and it's a little bit uncertain around here, and my version is somewhere else, and we have lots of different opinions, and the computer can have its own aggregate opinion as well. Yeah? <clears throat> okay, so anyone want to have a go at a definition of machine learning? Go on. Learning as machine, machines. <coughs> sorry, learning is done by machines. <laughs> Nicely rearranged the language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That's the important yeah. point, repeated trials. Learning, um, learning through experience. I'm sorry, uh, permanent changes to what about the machine? Uh, the machine information. Yeah. I don't remember the exact definition of well. The machine states or machine information. Yeah. Or machine, machine state database. The machine, the machine's <coughs> programming or <coughs> state is changed by repeated trials. The repeated trials is a key 
thing. It's a bit like learning to juggle. You learn to juggle by practicing and keep learning and you, you learn the movements. The machine learning is the same by, think of the pizzas. You show the computer, uh, the computer lots of pizzas that have the right amount of pepperoni, you show it lots of pizzas that have the wrong amount of pepperoni. And the idea is, it will then know when it sees new pizzas whether they have enough pepperoni or not. The same way as you would know if you saw enough pizzas with the right amount and with the wrong amount. We'll talk about the way these machines work in the next week or so. Next week or two. But just for now, the definition. So machine learning is a specific part of artificial intelligence that's about the construction and study of systems that can learn from data. And that's the important thing, the idea of repeated trials. <coughs> These machines learn from information. They're not programmed, we don't tell them what to do, they learn something. So perhaps something very simple. For example, a machine learning system could be trained on email messages to learn to distinguish spam and not spam. Guess what? Most email systems, if you use Gmail, your spam filter is a little artificial intelligence system that recognizes certain keywords. And it may, their spam filter continually learns as it is shown more and more spam. And as the spam evolves and change, the people who write spam try to change it to get cleverer, to get through the filters. They continually show it how the spam is changing and it continually changes and relearns the difference between spam and non spam. Virus checkers work in, many virus checkers work in similar ways. So help me to understand, when I uh, click on, in, a, in our student system, when I get some spam shows up in my box, and I go and I click on the report as spam, mm -hmm. what, what happens then? Well, it, I don't know if that feeds into the system, but mm -hmm. um, in a system that was working like this, um, that would be reported to the machine as spam the machine would scan that email, look at the terms, the language, the words that are used, the keywords, it would look at the structure and how those words are organized, it would look at the kind of size of the file, the content, it may also look at where the location it came from as well, and, the address. <coughs> and all those factors will be put together and it will add that to its database of a spam message. But you've got to remember it will see millions of spam messages and there will be certain factors that it recognises that make them spam. Um, and it will start to recognise those factors and when those come in, it will mark them as spam. Um, but after learning, the important thing about machine learning systems is that they work on new information they haven't seen before. So you train them, like the pizza idea, you train it. If it sold this, it, it would be easy if you show it 10 good pizzas and 10 bad pizzas. If you show it the same pizzas, it should be able to recognize them. But this isn't about recognition. It's about learning particular traits of those pizzas. So when it sees new pizzas, it can make that decision. Um, let me finish this and then I'll tell you a story. So, Machine learning, there are two key things about teaching machines to learn. One is representation. How does a machine read the email and store that information? How does it recognize the pizza? Does it take a picture or does it count the numbers of pieces of pepperoni? How do we represent the information in the computer? And generalization, that once it has this knowledge, it's not remembering every instance, it's recognizing general trends in the email or general trends in the amount of pepperoni on the pizza. So we need to represent the data and functions. This is part of the machine learning. Convert it into something the computer can analyze. So in the email example, it gives an example. We could represent the email of a set of words and, discard, uh, and not consider word order, just consider the words. Generalization is that the system will perform on unseen data. So new things it sees, it can work on and make generalization. And this is the main area, getting the machine to work on these new instances. So, Rob? Um, I was just wondering, um, 
in the current state of the artificial intelligence, how good is um, how good is an AI at being able to um, define or, or uh, adjust to something like it's something non-concrete like uh, skill level. Um, you know, on the uh, the Xbox, they have uh, like their true skill um, thing that it, in theory, is supposed to pair you with people that you know if you're absolutely terrible at mm -hmm. at Halo, like I am. You know, the the system is in theory supposed to pair you with other people that are just as bad at Halo in order, or and I think a few others that aren't are a little bit better, so that you know you can play with people at your skill level and still uh, feel. That's a slightly different algorithm than so, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a slightly different technique. But um, a better example of that, uh, Kevin can tell you about it. Um, yeah, actually, with uh, one of the studies I did last year, and actually one of the studies I'm doing right now, um, it's with the game Hawksmith, like we were talking about earlier in the last class, actually. And what it does is it doesn't necessarily have like a concrete, difficult setting. Like, whereas like Guitar Hero or Rocksmith, you can go and set to like easy, medium, or hard. You basically start off on a very um, beginner level. So you're going to start off on the easiest level, but as you're playing, the game will recognize. Right. This game, you have you put the yeah. real guitar into a PlayStation and you play the real guitar. Yeah, because so. essentially the game um, helps teach you how to play an extra guitar. So you plug um, your any kind of guitar into the system through a quarter inch USB cable. Um, and what the game does is it starts off on the easiest level there is, and as you're playing throughout the game, it recognizes, okay, if they're getting, you know, so many notes, now we're going to give them some more notes, and then eventually you work up from playing, you know, a couple of notes of a song to playing the entire song. But it recognizes which things you're not good at, whether mm -hmm. it's chord structures or frets, and adjusts the game to match which bits you can play and can't play. And lets you practice, and or will yeah. focus on specific aspects you're not playing very well <coughs> to make sure you learn those. Is this like how, uh, like Google is basically organizing searches based on things that you have? Talk to bubbles. Oh, that, that's another class I'm teaching at the moment in hypermedia. <laughs> we're going to do, we're doing filter bubbles and uh, person. Um, you may all know that Web 1.0 was this idea like television where the internet was um, people put information on servers and it was sent out to machines that you owned and you got that information. Web 2.0 is where we start talking to each other, social media sharing our photos and talking with each other. Web 3.0 is where the information you get is personalized to you. So. If each of us type the word Egypt into Google, we'd all get different responses. It'd be personalized to us. Google uses 57 different indicators of who you are. The browser you use, your social economic group, where you are in the world, everything like that. Um, and it's something we're studying in my, we're going to, I always do a politics and ethics of the internet section and we're going to be looking at filter bubbles this year. Um, but that, Google uses AI in its search, but I, I'm not sure if the filter bubbles work on AI. I don't know what the algorithms are. There's, there's I would imagine they are, but it would make sense. There was a TED talk. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Exactly. I'll be showing the TED talk in my class. Yeah. yeah. If you, that is worth looking up. Do a search on the TED talks for filter bubble. Google filter. There's a great TED talk. The guy shows you just how. Um, Facebook's another interesting example that um, uh, it looks at which links you click on. Uh, take the recent um, election. If you tended to click on liberal links more, it will actually show less right-wing Republican feeds or links or comments from your friends because it knows you're more left-wing. And so your Facebook feed is filtered as well based on what you click on. Yeah, so we, we, it's a very, uh, we live in this very filtered information world, which is news stories are filtered based on your interest. If you tend to click more technology stories on CNN's webpage, they'll put more CNN technology stories in your newsfeed, and you'll get less of other things. So. It's just a technological dominant track, like this, like this, like this. Yeah, so it just feeds you more of what you like.
um, which there's good and bad sides to it. It's nice to see more of the things you're interested in, but it means you're not getting the breadth of information and the opposing viewpoints that you possibly should be getting. So, um, yeah, that's a, it's a little fascination with mine. I, I, I hate the way people track you online, and I, I'm going to be teaching my class how to stop people tracking you as well. So, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I'll tell you my favourite machine learning story, which I told some people in the bar uh, who came out last week. So, the American military um, had this great idea. Uh, during the first Gulf War, you may have watched the footage from the Gulf War when they send a missile in to attack someone. They have a camera on the front of the missile, and you can watch these missiles go in. They showed this. You've all, have you all seen that news footage where you watch missiles going in? So they had this idea, what if that camera could recognize its target and could decide whether to detonate the missile or not? So if the missile was going to hit a hospital instead of a military installation, it would recognize that it was a hospital and the missile wouldn't detonate. Great idea. So they decided that the first test they do of this is with missiles that attack vehicles and they would get the missile to recognize when it was hitting a tank and when it was hitting a civilian vehicle, and it wouldn't detonate it if it hit a civilian vehicle. So the war was in progress, so out in the Middle East, they had all these tanks on maneuvers out there, so they took thousands of photographs of tanks. Back in America, they went out on the roads and they took thousands of photos of vehicles, cars, trucks, just on roads. They got a machine learning system to look at all these photographs and recognize all the tanks and all the, the different vehicles. 99.9% .9 accuracy. It recognized the tanks, recognized the vehicles. Great. So then they showed it unseen instances, photos it had never seen before of tanks and trucks. 98, 99% accuracy. Really. So then they went into development and they fitted these little the computers that had learned this information, little, little circuit boards, attached to the cameras on the front of the weapons. They then went out on firing ranges where they had tanks and trucks to try it out. 50% accuracy. Sometimes it blew up tanks, sometimes it blew up trucks, sometimes it didn't blow up tanks, sometimes it didn't blow up trucks. And they couldn't work out why it wasn't working. And then someone actually pointed out that all the photos they took in Iraq had bright blue sky. And all the photos they took in America, it was raining or the weather was pretty bad. So, and that's what the, photo, the, the learning system had actually learned, the weather. And so, every time there was blue sky, it blew up. <coughs> and every time it rained, it didn't blow up. So, these, and there's, there's a moral behind this story about these systems, the learning systems. We are not giving them explicit rules, if this, then that. So... They can, they're like a black box solution. They learn something, but you don't know exactly what they've learned. And they are very hard to interrogate and find out what's happened in there. And when we, when we talk, I'm going to talk a little bit next week about the technology in these systems, and you'll see why we can't interrogate them when we talk about how a neural network works. So. Um, last one. Artificial consciousness, anyone want to hazard a guess at a definition for that? The machine that knows it's one. The machine that knows it's one. There was an interesting thing Ken Campbell said in that last bit. They're surprised, the conversations seem very lighthearted and deep, but they, 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 they're very intu intuitive and cover a lot of the key areas, and he said you could program this machine to know it's one. You could get it to play a tune, to leap for joy. But you've told it that, does it really know? And he said that in the kind of little clip, but I've forgotten the exact words he used. You know, it could be programmed to know it's one, but does it know it's one? Yes, it's this thing of knowing. And the concept of knowing 
comes around the concept called intentionality. We'll, we're going to talk about Searle and uh, the philosopher John Searle and intentionality, <coughs> which you probably know a lot about doing cognitive science, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> but we'll talk a little bit about John Searle and intentionality uh, over the next week, because it's a key aspect about neural nets and artificial consciousness. But. So, artificial consciousness, also known as machine consciousness, or synthetic consciousness. It's a particular field related to artificial intelligence. Whenever you say artificial intelligence, people think that's what you're talking about. It's a very specific area. It's also in cognitive robotics. The aim is to define that which we would have to be synthesized were consciousness to be found in an engineered artifact. So if we had a machine that we could define that this was conscious, that's what this field is trying to build. So the very definition of it is that we will build an artifact that is conscious. That's what the field is. Issue with this, anyone know what kind of problem with this is? What I said at the start of the lecture. But. Uh, the idea of solipsism. The idea of what? The idea of solipsism. That you don't even know if other people are conscious, let alone the robot. It, it's about definitions again. We can't define intelligence. We can't define consciousness. We can't measure consciousness. We don't. We don't know anything. Do you have a soul? <laughs> Do I have these or these questions? Um, we can't define these things. So, how do we know that an object has a consciousness? What what do we? We can't measure it in a human. How can we measure it in a machine? So this is the problem with this. Um, Neuroscience says that consciousness is generated within the brain, and we have this term we call the neural correlates of consciousness. And what we believe, what, what people, um, there's a term, there are many different, I, I said artificial intelligence is fragmented, there are many arguments, many different fractions. There's a group which is called Hard AI, they call themselves Hard AI, and they believe, uh, Minsky leads this group, that artificial consciousness is possible. He believes that human consciousness is like, a, in some way, <laughs> um, simpler than we believe it is, and then we can construct machines that replicate this, the way our brains work. And we can build computer systems that emulate this neural correlates of consciousness concept. So we can build artificial brains that will have this. There are many designations of consciousness and many different types of consciousness. You can have weaker consciousness. Um, recognizing shapes is a form of consciousness. It's something we do as a form of our consciousness. Computers can do that. So I'm going to bring this to a close with and show you another clip from um, brain spotting and let Patrick take over to discuss what some of this means in bigger terms. But I'm going to touch on the philosophy myself with, in, if you read anything in, even in artificial intelligence books about artificial consciousness, they often talk about it in philosophical terms. They talk about access and phenomenal variants of consciousness. So access consciousness are things we can describe. Aspects of experience amenable to functional description. So things we can talk about. Phenomenal consciousness is more of this intentionality idea. Aspects of experience that define depiction. So what something feels like, what it feels like to eat an apple, will a machine ever understand what that feels like? It could have a chemical reaction, it could be told what that experience is, but will it really know what that is like? This idea of a um, phenomenal um, aspect of that. So I'm going to finish with a philosophical thought experiment from Ken Campbell again in brain spotting. Any comments on that before I show you this clip? Um, just for, for fun, 
where would something like um, the uh, the T one hundred and one uh, in you know Terminator two before he says the part? Now I know why you cry. Like what what level of AI is the is that's the way beyond anything we can do now. I mean, most of these movies are dealing with the idea of sentient conscious AI. 2001, Pam, it's a machine that makes decisions above its programming, that they become sentient, they have knowledge. So the Terminator robots are the same, they behave like humans, they have emotions, all these things, you know. They're, they're, most of the science fiction deals with robots or artificial intelligence. The movie AI is another great example where they deal with concepts of um, machines that have consciousness. So they're all looking at where the future, and people say, that even the movie's called AI, it's not really about AI, it's about artificial consciousness. Uh, yeah, this one. 